if you say, well, science hasn't found it yet. Science hasn't found any evidence for the existence of God. Well, does science, is science interested in the question to begin with? Science cannot, is not prepared to ask this question. Science looks for where it lost the ring under the street light because that's the only place that it has any light. There's a number of things that science doesn't know. If you to read some literature, I've, I, I enjoy popular science literature and I read such books and, uh, and magazines. Among the questions that science doesn't know is, for example, if, uh, very, some very basic questions. How does a candle work? Nobody knows. There are literally tens of thousands of chemical reactions involved. In, uh, how does alcohol work on the brain exactly? Nobody knows exactly. No one can explain the exact mechanism by what, how it works. Why does a shower curtain, when you're in the shower, tend to uh, glide over towards the stream of water that's coming down? Nobody knows this either. Uh, what gives matter its most basic property, mass, as we mentioned? Nobody knows this. The scientists don't know this. You know? And how does gravity work? They don't know this either. Uh, taxonomy, you know, is the classification of uh, plants and animals. About, uh, at a, at a uh, optimistic estimate, between 5 and 10 percent of the life forms on the planet have been named, i.e. discovered. We don't know most of the things that are on even the planet Earth. And so, uh, why this tremendous uh, epistemological uh, optimism, if not hubris, it's more like arrogance, that, they, that science has discovered everything and that what science has not discovered doesn't exist. And the shower curtain obviously exists despite the scientists <laughs> and the, these other things. And so what, you know, this is an unreasonable demand to, or it's an unreasonable premise. And it's just what science hasn't discovered isn't, uh, you know, doesn't, isn't worth knowing. Uh, the Big Bang, before which there was nothing, they said, well, there was a few things that were before it, <laughs> but what was before them? You know, things are, if it was contingent, then uh, did things have an origin? And from whence did they come? Now, these things are not, uh, you know, they, so they're not cut and dried things. So it turns out about 85, uh, about uh, uh much of the biomass on the planet, I believe it's about 85% uh, of the biomass on the planet. In other words, if you piled all the plants and animals on top of each other, you know, on the face of the earth, and uh, is, is, is in fact uh, microorganisms that exist under the surface of the earth, some of them extremely far down, some of them don't breathe oxygen, you know, some of them are not carbon-based organisms, they're boron-based organisms. Some survive on hydrogen. You know, they don't breathe oxygen at all. Completely weird life forms that nobody had. And if you took all of these out of the Earth, according to the present uh, presumption about how many of them there are, they would equal a pile of organic matter that was about five feet tall, spread over the, all of the Earth's surface. It's a huge amount of it. No one even had a, the faintest clue that they existed before the uh, 1980s. And so the presumption that science is the default knowledge and that what science hasn't discovered has there's no presumption for it to exist is not a very, it's not borne out by the hist uh, history of scientific discovery. And so why should we presume it? So this is uh, you know, one point about the about faith and about you know I don't you know all I accept is the facts. <laughs> you know, well, what are the facts? And how come you walk into buildings? How come if you hear two, how come if you hear a piece of information from three people on the street? You know if you heard three people say at different parts of the town. You know for example the uh, the vice president has been shot. You would believe it. You heard it from this person, you heard it from another person, you hear it from the three person. It's, it's finished. It's a fact as far as you're concerned. 
So similarly, there are there are uh, influential interpretations of the way that the world works, and they change. Science changes. New discoveries will be revising, probably fairly radically, our conception of the cosmos. So religion is also an explanation of why things happen. It's a teleological explanation. It doesn't go from uh, one cause and then the other thing is caused out of it, and and therefore it caused the third thing, which begs the question as to the origin of things. Where did it begin? Where did it begin? And so why should the most interesting event of all if you take a scientifically scientific causative uh, explanation of things, uh, why should the most interesting event of all, the Big Bang or its father, <laughs> have no causal explanation at all? The big exception. <laughs> and if it doesn't, if, if it does have a cause, you know, it just says there, there's a regress there, so we have to explain it. And if it doesn't have a cause, then why should it be the exception to the rule that you've made that everything has to have a cause to explain it? Yeah. Whereas the religion explains things in terms of they, they exist because they're, they point towards some uh, goal, they point towards something. The Martin Rees, of your... Uh, the, the astronomer Royal in Cambridge has written his book, the uh, just six numbers, in which he establishes that there are certain ratios: the ratios of uh, that, uh, hydrogen, the, uh, the squares, uh, the uh, relations, basic relations of matter. There are six uh, ratios that exist that if they didn't exist, the universe could not exist, could not be as we know it, could not exist at all, as a matter of fact. And the chances of these six numbers coming about in confluence together is impossibly remote. You know, it's, it's one person, another physicist, expressed it. It's just the, it's the possibility of the world assembling itself, that these six numbers should come together in exactly these ratios. It's about like the possibility of a tornado hitting a junkyard and assembling a Boeing 747. <laughs> I mean, the, you know, things uh, are, have a, a, so show us a fantastic complexity and a fantastic uh, design. And a design argues for a designer. The origin of life, you know, we've talked about this before, and, you know, the origin of life, you know, the, 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 the nutrient soup theory that the surface of the planet just cooked up, you know, the amino acids, and they assembled themselves into life. You know, it's... Uh, it's in the history of uh, cytology, of the, the, the knowledge, human knowledge about how cells work, this was possible to believe before the discovery of the electron microscope. But if, in light of what we know today, you know, the simplest cell that exists looks about as simple as New York City. You know, it has tens of thousands of parts. And so, what are the chances of such an entity assembling itself? No, not just assembling itself, assembling itself and having also a reproductive system that would be able to produce another exactly like it. <laughs> it doesn't sound very feasible on the basis of what we see around us. If you see you know, a novel you know, like War and Peace, you say, well, yes, it's conceivable that a typewriter, you know, it could have fallen down a staircase and, you know, written a word, you know, and, and pr- produced something like, but, you know, when you see a novel like War and Peace, you say, well, there must be a Tolstoy behind it somewhere. <laughs> and similarly, in the natural world, 